All right, welcome everyone to the New America Foundation. Uh, I'm Marvin Amori. I am a Future Tense Fellow here. Uh, I tend to write about uh, the internet and the First Amendment and how people communicate through new technology. Uh, I'm really excited about this discussion uh, with two authors, Christine Rosen, who has a forthcoming book uh, on how technology mediates our relationship with reality, and Doug Rushkoff, uh, the author of uh, the book out there and this book right here, uh, Present <laughs> Shock, When Everything Happens Now. Uh, and we're really excited to have both of these thinkers. Because uh, one, um, one of the things I've noticed in the last few years is a sort of wave of books uh, about how technology changes the way we think. Right? Is it making us smarter? Is it making us dumber? Is it making our thinking more shallow or less shallow? Uh, and uh, I think you know, this is an issue that, Doug, you've thought about quite a bit. And your book really kind of tries to think through uh, you know, how the human mind changes in light of new technology. So, so why don't you sort of talk a little bit about um, your thoughts? Sure. Um, it's interesting. I mean, I don't see present shock as, as certainly not entirely a technological book or issue. You know, I think we are, we are in a digital age, so things are different. But it's not just technology that, that makes things different. You know, the reason I called it present shock was, you know, I was raised in the era of future shock, when that was the, sort of the seminal text and where that was the the kind of the prevailing cultural attitude was this leaning forward towards the new millennium. We had all these shows. Remember before Walt Disney was on, there was this show on the 21st century that was about you know monorails and jetpacks. And the late 1990s then was so much about you know the long boom and the dot com boom and speculation and what's going to happen and the Y2K bug and planes falling out of the sky and. The, the millennium approaching and the harmonic convergence and 2012, it was all, where are we going? What's going to happen? There was this palpable sort of leaning forward that then when we hit the year 2000, it felt like all of a sudden everything kind of stopped, that we weren't in a forward leaning moment anymore, but in a present based one, that we weren't really in the industrial age anymore with its expansion and requirement for growth and new territories and new conquests and new sticking flags on the moon and getting to big projects but we were kind of like here you know now what um, and that's why the market crashed in February March of 2000 that's why people started to look at um, alternatives to growth and started to consider things like sustainability as as compared to growth you know, and coupled with that was the emergence of digital technology, which originally I thought was going to be a way for people to take back their time. You know, I was part of the slacker generation, so we were looking for ways to increase slack, which meant time just spent reading philosophy or having fun, as opposed to punching the clock and working and being some kind of a yuppie scum, you know, get a job person. And digital technology seemed like a great answer a tool for us because now we could work in our own time in our underwear from home uh, and do it directly with other people rather than even working for the man you know we would have some kind of an Etsy burning man like peer-to-peer -peer trading future and instead it seemed like what we did uh, around the turn of the century is Wired magazine sort of announces that we're in an attention economy and the internet becomes the salvation of the kind of dying industrial age model and rather than having new territories to expand to we decide that human attention and human time is the new commodity and we take these time-saving devices and strap them to our bodies and have them ping us every time someone wants to alert us or Facebook us or tweet about us or send us an ad or do this we end up in this state of constant emergency interruption where we no longer uh, uh, are really in, uh, in full control of our nervous systems. We end up in the state that used to be endured only by 911 operators and, and, and air traffic controllers. And that's, it's not only you know, dangerous or bad for the mind and frying of the nervous system, but it's, it's missing the opportunity of digital technology. So I'm pro-digital technology, but 
anti the way we use digital technology because we're just using it, I think, to amplify and extend the obsolete kind of growth imperatives of the industrial age rather than using it to um, embrace or experiment with, with the new possibilities of, of a digital age. And present shock is really just that, uh, that one way of dealing with, uh, in a shocked way, with the temporal compression, with a world without beginnings, middles, and ends, without goals, without sort of long range goals, when this sense of, of your future and your past just careening into you like your second grade friends on Facebook and the ads that are coming to you from a, a big data future that you didn't even know you were going to have. You know, that, that shock could also be uh, a kind of a presentism, uh, a positive presentism where we, we embrace the humanity of the real moment that we're in and kind of reclaim home field advantage over the temporal landscape. So, Christine, this is something you've thought about quite a bit uh, in terms of the effect of alerts and constant notifications uh, on our life. Uh, what, what do you have to say about, um, about what Doug said, the comments? Um, well, I highly recommend the book. I have to say it was such a fun read. And you are an optimist, which is nice. It's a nice change to read about technology and a thoughtful optimist, I would say. I kept thinking, I jotted down this Paul Valeri quote, the trouble with our times is that the future is not what it used to be. And that's what I kept thinking of when I was reading Doug's book because he's not saying, oh, we're all going to hell in a handbasket. But he was saying, you know, things haven't turned out the way we'd hoped, so how do we change that? And that's, I think, a very optimistic, it, gi it gives us some room for agency. So having said all those nice things, now I want to push you a little bit on how we do that. Because one, the other thing that kept coming up, you have excellent um, discussion of attention and sort of how our internal clocks work, about multitasking and its, and its um, negative side effects, the fact that we actually can't multitask, and this whole idea that our society in some ways, particularly in the business world, is trying to turn us to the rules of the machine rather than having the machines adapt to human needs. Um, but I kept thinking then about and I agree with everything you say about not being 24-7 available to everyone mm -hmm. all the time. And, and then I kept thinking about that new Facebook home commercial series. Have you seen these? Where yeah. there's a girl sitting at her boring family meal, and you know, she's, she instead takes herself away by touching Facebook home and, and engaging with her friends through the screen rather than with the people right in front of her. And this is a, a message that a lot of large companies in Silicon Valley are aggressively pursuing and encouraging us to pursue. So how do we square that circle between the more balanced approach you would like us to have, and the fact that the companies who are creating the software and technologies we use every day want us to do the opposite. It's hard to balance it. I mean, the, the funny thing about those Facebook commercials, I mean, and there's also one of a guy at work that he's mm -hmm. at the meeting where this new tool is being announced and he's not paying attention to uh, Zuckerberg, and it's as if to say, oh, the joke's on us, or, you know, so, so now we can all laugh about it. But what they're doing is taking the weakness and just advertising it as a strength. Right. Right? The problem with this stuff is it's going to distract you from whatever it is you should be doing. Um, but it's, oh no, that's a good thing. Is it? You know, and of course it's not. But if you don't like your life, then it is a good thing. If you don't like your neighbors, then it is a good thing not to know who they are. If you don't like your family, then it is a good thing to get to talk to other people. Um, and this is, I mean, as I see it, this is w the, the, the downside of you know, con sort of consumer-driven capitalism is that the growth of the, the, to sell more objects to people in less time, we need people not to like each other. You know, it's sort of, it, it, when, you know, when, when, it's true though, on a certain <laughs> level, right? A certain kind of growth. You know, when I was a kid, I was raised in a, in a middle-class neighborhood of Queens where there was one barbecue pit at the end of the block that everybody used. And we were all friends with our neighbors, it was a whole thing. We moved to Scarsdale, which is this rich Westchester suburb, and now there's one barbecue in everybody's yard. You know, and that's better for the grill company, but we weren't barbecuing with the Joneses anymore. Now we were barbecuing against the Joneses in that sort of competitive way. So I feel like the, the, our, our technological companies, for the most part, are going to make more money as long as our communications and interactions are mediated by their devices by their interfaces because even if we're not paying to use it at least they're scraping data from those interactions if I'm just talking to you in real life they don't get that so don't so know I mean I don't believe that these are real choices that they're giving us oh now you don't like where you are you have the choice to leave you know and where I actually think that it's real life that's getting interrupted by almost the intrusive choice yeah. of the possibility of leaving 
It's tricky though, you know, it's like, this is the same debate that, that in some ways we had in the late 90s, I was at this synagogue and they brought me in to discuss whether it was ethical according to Jewish law, I got back to Zionism, I'm sorry, whether it was ethical, um, I said with anything but Zionism as a joke, um, uh, whether it was ethical in Jewish law to have old people get to watch Shabbat service through a computer rather than going. And it's like, yeah, it can count for their Shabbat, but it's not ethical for the community to stop going to that old person's house to bring them to the Shabbat because they now have a technology that's good enough. So it's sort of that, it's that, yes, we have new choices, but those choices, new choices sort of force us to, to, to look at whether we really want to be taking them. Okay, on the issue of choice, the other thing that popped up is that you have a lot of examples um, of, you know, things, sites like Etsy, where people are, you know, cranking out the artisanal yeah. pickles in every basement in Brooklyn, and, you know, this is all for the good, you know, people can make a living doing creative work and selling it online. Um, but I was thinking, and, and you have, I think, a, a really good model for how the different approaches one could take to um, set up a, a, a day where you can get your creative work done mm -hmm. and not be distracted. And, and you have the example of a friend who makes candles and sells them on Etsy. But I kept thinking, um, in my, you know, my earliest jobs, I, w I had a time punch card and I had a very obnoxious boss. And I had no control over when I did my yeah. work. I did it when I was told. And that's the reality and the truth for a lot of workers in this country, if they're lucky enough even to have jobs. Um, and so I was thinking, if you look at the way technology is being integrated into the workplace, it's not just in a way to manage and control our productivity as creative workers or knowledge class workers, but look at a factory or look at people who, who um, have to wash their hands, food service workers who are now being tracked with sensors to make sure they're standing in front of the sink and washing their hands every time they use mm -hmm. the bathroom. So again, it goes to this point of technology can be good or bad. What are your thoughts about that level of control when it's imposed by a corporation or in the previous week's news, the government, um, the kind of surveillance that's yeah. going on both at the <laughs> domestic and international. Well, they're, they're different in different ways. I mean, in, in, in terms of the temporal control over people, I would argue the companies that exercise it are making a mistake. They're actually making a productivity and a profit mistake on a certain level. That, again, what the, what, one of the great things we got in the industrial age was the clock. You know, that's when the clock really replaced the calendar as the, as, as the way we organize. And with the clock, we got to break up the day into all these units. With the clock, we got the ability now to pay people for their time rather than to pay people for the value they created. I mean, Marx and all talk about this. That this was sort of the beginning of the alienation of the worker from the value they created, right? So now I'm not getting paid to make a shoe. I'm getting paid for an hour or two hours or three hours of shoe making. Right? So now I, no, I'm no longer connected to the value of the shoe, just the time that I put into it. It's also when we changed money, right? So money, instead of money being a reflection of how much grain came in from the fields and we're going to use a receipt to say that grain, now money is something that's issued with interest. It's, it's a product of the clock. Time quite literally became money. I'm going to issue this money. It has to be paid back with interest in this amount of time. So in every dollar, there's this clock that's also running. So that's why the, the bias then of uh, uh, management goes from you know innovation and quality goes to time management and scientific management of people and stopwatch management and sort of became the, was was right before computers and now we're using computers to extend that yet what we're finding when we do treat people in that way as cogs in the machine not only does their ability to innovate and and come up with new ideas and uh, uh, their, their quality go down but their quality of life goes down shift workers have more cancer you know, they're, they're, when, you, when you're changing them around, they get more stress and more post-traumatic stress. Whereas if you, and this is where it starts to sound new agey, but if you start looking at how does human time work, how do biological clocks work underneath the way, way people are, well, what are circadian rhythms? What is the day-night balance in, in work? What are the weeks during a lunar cycle when people are more creative? When do they want to rest? How do neurotransmitters change over the course of a month? When you start looking at that, like I did just, I looked at the tip of the iceberg for this book, I started to find out, oh, the first week of a new moon, people's acetylcholine is higher. Second week, their serotonin goes up. Third week, their dopamine goes up. Fourth week, their norepinephrine goes up. Well, acetylcholine's good for meeting people, good for new ideas, great for launching a new product into the marketplace. Serotonin is great for working, for head down, gonna push through. Dopamine's great for parties, concerts. 
Uh, uh, this is when you have your, your retreat. You do your offsite during a dopamine week. Norepinephrine is very analytical. It's cold. It's a fight or flight response. Great for doing. That's this week, I asked Doug. Yeah, we're in, organization. We're in the analytical week. <laughs> it's an analytical week. Yeah, yeah. You do your organ. For me, it'll be organize the chapters of a book and the structure. You know, so if you understand that as either an employer or a marketer, all of a sudden you're now optimizing your company to sort of human moods and, and cultural moods. We're going through this collectively. Everybody's in the same week. It's like, well, whoa, now we have actually uh, more power rather than less. So it's, it's, sort of, it's sort of that. In terms of total surveillance control and all that, it, it's dark. I mean, I think what happened to government now is government's in present shock. Government looks and says, look, Facebook has all this big data and they can predict when someone's going to get pregnant, when they're going to turn gay, when they're going to buy a car. You know, and Google can predict all this. I want ins on some of that. I got some needs of prediction here, right? So they end up employing the technology automatically. The technology just grows so fast, and let's use this, let's use that, let's use this. They, they just like a person unthinkingly putting email on his arm and having it vibrate every time anybody emails him, rather than learning how the technology works and deciding, oh, I'm going to let it vibrate when it's my wife or my kid, but not let it vibrate when it's anybody else, rather than doing that, Government does the same thing. They just grab the thing. Let's just take it all and do it all in total control and see what everything we can. They're like, well, wait a minute. You need to use this in a, in a more intelligent way. So the, the story you tell about the clock, the story of the clock uh, becoming a tool of management and of divorcing workers from their value mm -hmm. and then tying it to their time. You know, what, what I've thought about in terms of the last... 20 years with the internet, you know, to me it feels like a very liberating mindset change. Mm -hmm. That now, you know, there was a time you know, 20 years ago when you know, there, was, uh, you know, there were people who wrote for the, pa for, the New York, for the papers, people who sent letters into the editor hoping to get published. But then we moved mm -hmm. to a moment where all of us can just hit the word publish, and it just became like revolutionary. There was a time when like, you couldn't be a publisher, now all of us can be publishers. But there was a time when you know, people had Encyclopedia Britannica, and you'd read it if you could afford it. And now everyone in the world has an encyclopedia and can edit it and contribute to it. Uh, and when I sort of read about the sort of thinking about innovation and motivating employers and sort of getting them to innovate, the idea is that now even people who use your product can be innovators, Let, including also People at the, the bottom of the employment chain mm -hmm. can innovate. You want to make sure they can communicate up. And it's no longer just management telling people what to do and a sort of top-down uh, structure of, you know, daddy knows best in media, in, in jobs. Mm -hmm. there's, sort of, there's sort of, I think, a, a reawakening of the idea that everyone has a certain amount of creativity and can contribute and that we should structure jobs in that way. And just to use one example, for a long time Google had uh, a 20% project for every engineer. Every engineer could spend 20% of their time every week on whatever they wanted. Right? The, the, whatever they created would be owned by Google, but right, because it was, on, yeah, but. It was, on, Google, it was on Google's time, but, yeah, the, but, but, the, health insurance. but the, idea, no, the idea was simple. The idea was we want our workers to innovate, and the way, best way they'll innovate is by letting them do whatever they want. Right. And so they created, I think, Gmail and a whole bunch of other really popular products through having no management and just letting people innovate. So, so when I see sort of the, the flip side of um, you know, sort of the, the, the positive story away tailorization, I see sort of a, a, a sort of more confidence in the imagination of the average human uh, now that we have the internet. Yeah, I mean, and there's some of that. There's some of that to go around. On, on the other hand, um, I feel like what often happens is a new medium comes around and an elite seizes the new capability on offer where most people really just seize the capability of the last renaissance, right? So we get reading, you know, and we, we get text. And God says to Abraham, you will be a nation of priests, right? Meaning you'll all be able to read this stuff and you're going to be able to... And what did we get? You know, by the Middle Ages, we've got rabbis going to the town square reading Torah to people who stand there listening. So people can now hear the word of God like Pharaoh could centuries before, but only the elite, the rabbis, can read. Then we get the printing press. We think, oh, did we get a nation of writers? No. Now we got people who could read, but an elite who had, who had access to the press, they could write. Now we get computers, and the people can write. 
We can all blog, but can the people program? No. The people can't program. The elite program. The elite programs the interfaces through which all of this interactivity takes place. So, you know, as long as we're blogging on Blogger, or as long as we're tweeting on Twitter, as long as we're updating on Facebook, you know, that's fine. So we're great. We've got the great 13th century capability of Gutenberg, but we have so little understanding of the platforms on which on which this is happening. We think it's free. Oh, it's free. We get to do this for free. Why is Gmail free? We found out last week why Gmail's free, right? Because <laughs> we're paying with our data. We've been paying all along. So, you know, so there's that. On, on, on the other hand, I, I absolutely agree. The, the, pop, the real opportunity here is to transcend jobs altogether. Right? This is the part of the book that gets all supposedly lefty, but it's not lefty. It's righty, if anything. It's, it's, it's post-righty. Um, is uh, Obama and everybody are out there saying, we need to create more jobs. We need to create more jobs. Why do we need to create more jobs? Who wants a job? I don't want a job. Do you want a job? Does anybody want a job? Jobs are an artifact of the industrial age. There weren't jobs before then. There was just work. People made stuff. People did things. Jobs only came around after corporate charters and corporate monopolies when you had to work for a company in order to create value. Because you weren't allowed to have your own little company unless it was registered a registered monopoly. You weren't able to borrow money unless you were able to, you weren't able to start a business unless you could borrow money because local currencies were illegal. Now we're finally in a landscape where First off, we have enough technology that we don't need as many people employed to make all the stuff we need. Right? The jobs problem is that we can't figure out stuff for people to do because we've gotten so efficient at making stuff. It's like, what do we do with the toll collectors now that we don't need them anymore? Oh, well, kick them out of their houses first because they don't have any money to pay for them. And then what are we going to do with the houses? Well, let's tear down the houses because prices will go down if we let them sit empty in foreclosure. Let's burn the food that we don't need because we can't just let people have it because they don't have jobs. Right. Where we don't actually need jobs anymore at all in the sort of Etsy, I mean, in the Etsy handcrafted whatever. If making artisanal beers is going to actually give you something to do of meaning, then you should be doing that. You know, it's we're we're actually past the point. We're in the place that Norbert Wiener and Vannevar Bush and all the early theorists were futurizing about. What if we get to a place where we actually do have robots that can till the fields, and and Googles that can drive the cars? You know, whatever they're called, you know, Google bots or do they have a self name for it? Cars. Self driving yeah, cars. There you go, self driving cars. What do we do? What do we do with the cab drivers? You know, we let them have fun, you know, is what we do. We let them write video games. We let them, you know, do, do creative tasks for one another. Our, our real problem is that we're running a digital economy on a 13th century economic operating system, right? We're stuck on a, a printing press era scarcity based growth mandated bank-based central currency OS, which is why you look at companies, that's a funny part, you look at Google and Facebook and Twitter, these digital age companies, they're not the first digital age companies. These are the last industrial age companies. These people, they're so happy to disrupt newspapers. They're so happy to disrupt TV. They're happy to disrupt politics. They're happy to disrupt everybody's industry. Right? But what do they do the first chance they get? They go to Goldman Sachs and they say, oh, daddy, Give me a Series B, you know. Um, they they want to have an IPO, right? They want to just they go back to the oldest thing, oldest thing in the book, and sell their company to the man. You know, the first digital age companies are going to be the ones that flip that and say, oh, we don't actually even need to do that. If you got six kids and two laptops, you can grow your whole business. You can scale your whole thing. You can oh, actually okay, do it. Okay, now I have to interrupt because yeah. okay, you are not a righty. <laughs> It's not that's what, free market okay. capitalism. All right, but what about what about let's talk about the things that don't do so well under a free market system. Mm. Things like if you're a poet, or for example, any of the non-market humanities-based, very right. deeply humane, important work. I was a history PhD. You can see, you know, I can also say, would you like fries with that? Which is basically what you do if you have a right. humanities PhD this this day and age. Um, there is, every time, I, my UK publisher, I remember walking into their offices, and on one wall was a big blown up picture of Julian Barnes's latest novel, which I really enjoyed. On the other wall was a big blown up picture of Fifty Shades of Grey. And you know what? <laughs> one would not exist without the other. I mean, <laughs> many of us who write for a yeah. living, whether it's online or not, are su heavily subsidized by the Fifty Shades of Greys of the world. So y there are, but there is use and value in publishing excellent poetry and in, in mm. and having a whole generation of new composers of music. These things do not necessarily give you a market return, and you can't just turn them out in your basement with any hope of long-term, uh, the ability to support a family, for example. I mean, you can try, but it's, it's really, really a challenge. So the people who want to make pickles, I say go for it. But if you want to make poetry, it's going to be a bit harder to make 
a living for yourself. You can get published, yeah, but you're not going to necessarily be able to sustain yourself. So um, not, again, to be yeah. the pessimist here, but what about the non-market activities that we've always valued as a culture and a society that can't quite find a footing in this new uh, present I, I thought you were thinking of radically changing all of society to let taxi drivers out of jobs play and write video games. You're not thinking that they, they can actually make money as poets. You, you would change society somehow. Well, I would, I would, yeah, if I were in charge, um, <laughs> yeah, I would say, you know, food and shelter, the basic food and shelter is, is a given at this point, that we are, we are actually rich enough as not just as a nation but as a planet to, to supply all that pretty readily. You know, our, our main obstacles, I think, are market obstacles. We can't have free energy because what would the oil companies do? I mean, there's a lot we can't do right now because we don't have a way to justify um, distribution. Uh, and I do think that there, that there would be, in some sense, more of a market for poetry and alternative video games, which could be looked at as a kind of poetry, um, in a world where the taxi driver didn't have to drive the cab to stay alive. I mean, it depends. It would be a slow transition to an economy of meaning and, and learning rather than an economy of production. Okay, this is, he loves but, Occupy Wall Street. You have a good section in the book. Actually, not love is too strong a word. You, you, there's, I like. There's a really interesting analysis that Doug does in his book about Occupy Wall Street in a comparison to the Tea Party and in, in a discussion about how presentist-minded political movements um, are undermining themselves. Um, I disagreed with your take on the yeah. Occupy Wall Street movement. I think a lot of the problems that they had were, in fact, presentist problems. This, right. this unwilling, this kind of, it was cloaked in an idealism that was, of course, you know, very media friendly f at that point in time. But basically, if you can't get together, organize a, um, some sort of um, uh, platform and get a candidate out there to run either in a third party system or even in the two party system, how are you going to accomplish your goals? I mean, yelling and screaming about stuff is important. It's always had a place in a democracy. But then what do you do? How do you implement change? Well, this is the thing. I mean, uh, occupiers, and, and I, I, I think they feel this way. I certainly feel this way. Um, I, I often feel that the best path towards the things I want to see happen are not political action, but are activism. You know, direct activism. So it's not activism in order to change some policy thing, but let's just get this thing done and see if they arrest us. You know, and, you know, for for just getting water to the right people or doing the you know, there's, you know, sort of occupy Sandy. Let's just deal with this problem. Um, you know, because because politics, certainly national politics, feels so again so industrial age, so branded, so removed, so abstracted. It's so big. I mean, yeah, it does matter. I know it matters who's the president, but who is the president? Um, it feels like a big kind of a Coke Pepsi decision more than how are we going to get our local community less dependent on Pathmark and more able to create its own uh, sort of you know uh, agricultural reality? How do we get people to uh, support a community supported agriculture system? How do we improve our own public school? I mean, I just don't see um, the the state as so effective in in. In solving these things. I mean, what I liked about Occupy was its approach to presentism seemed to be one of, okay, we're going to be here now. In other words, we're going to be less about the sort of eyes on the prize, ends justify the means campaign to victory, and much more about process. I mean, it was also unbearable, right? Because it was so boring. Right? You'd sit there and do your general assembly. We're going to sit here until everybody agrees that this is where, we're, okay, we're all. Okay, good. We're all there. We're all agree. That was meaning that was when they agree. We're all gonna we're all gonna be there unless unless somebody stops. It's like oh my god. But it was um it was at least more genuinely presentist and less present shocked than I thought the Tea Party was or is, which is uh, the Tea Party is that kind of impatience of present shock. It's like oh I want it right now. Let's let's want this thing. They don't want to go through. You know they, they don't have the sort of the patience for for politics the way it works. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so as a as a lawyer, you know, when I think of uh, presentism, present shock, and the Tea Party and Occupy, I just think if I were part of the Occupy movement, I wouldn't worry about building a political party because the entire legal infrastructure is stacked against them. If you just go through all the Supreme Court cases, very hard to start a third party. Uh, the party primary system. Mm -hmm. Uh, in every state has been sort of gutted by Supreme Court decisions. You have Citizens United. You have mad redistricting 
uh, you have what people call you know, first past the post voting. You have an entire legal infrastructure that makes you think, gee, um, it felt like a democracy. And then the banks uh, defrauded everyone, tanked our economy, and still run everything. Right, so I'm just going to go protest because what, what else am I going to do? Not protest, though. That's the idea. There wasn't, I, don't think, I don't think of Occupy as much as protest as a prototype right, for a new political process, for a new kind of process that is less about uh, representative democracy and more about kind of direct action. Right? De democracy was never direct. I think direct democracy is kind of silly. Democracy is not meant to be direct. Democracy is meant to be indirect. You know, and, and activism can be direct. So okay. it's sort of a flip. But if you've ever yeah. had to vote in the state of California, which I have family members who do, direct democracy, I mean, if you try to graft one of those systems onto the other, you're going to have a real problem. I mean, my sister can't get potholes covered on her street yeah. because it's going to take a ballot initiative. I mean, the, the, the lengths that they have to go to because of this sort of... Yeah, and then people directly vote for things that you can't actually do. Like, exactly. We're going to vote for insurance should right. be zero. Well, so, <laughs> so I do think, I mean, yeah. one of the arguments um, that's been raised about technology's role in democracy is that it tends to be uniquely, generally positive, transparency good, openness, yeah. you know, direct um, uh, contact with one's representatives. But, I mean, I, there, there's, it's now an old example, but when all the offices in Congress got email addresses, everyone said, this is a huge boon for democracy. You can, you don't have to sit there and write a letter. You don't have to even, you can be less, you know, you can go to the public library and send an email to your representative and get feedback. Well, it actually led to more distance between people and the representatives because they were so inundated with, uh, you know, yeah. organized groups sending spam, tons of mail, uh, that now it's often harder to get through the system. You have to know someone who's going to pick up the phone. You've got, it, it was an ideal that had an unintended consequence. And I think with a lot of these discussions of presentism. I mean, the, the thing that you, you do a lot in this book, which I, another reason I really enjoyed is that there's a lot of history in here. Mm. There's a lot of, none of this is new. A lot of these challenges are old. We're looking at them in a different way and we're succeeding and failing in, in, in new and different ways. But the challenges are still deeply human. What it means to be an embodied human being who has an internal clock. What it means to, to want to do meaningful, productive work and also make a living doing it and support your family doing it. So in the sense of the historical knowledge, Americans are notoriously bad at knowing their own history, not mm -hmm. to mention the rest of the world, how much of what, I mean, I, I get the sort of we should know how to code, we should be able yeah. to control our own technologies, but how much of this is actually a bigger cultural issue of kind of a cultural, vast cultural illiteracy of our own history and how that hobbles us in the present? It is. I mean, and then we get even more illiterate when there's a wobble, right? right. When there's a transition moment. I mean, what I'm really writing about is a very, very old uh, dynamic or conflict between the two kinds of time, what the Greeks called chronos, which is time of the clock, and what they called kairos, which is human time or timing. Right? Chronos is, I crashed the car at 4.02. Right? What's the best time to tell dad I crashed the car? 4.15? No, it's after he's had his drink, before he's opened the bills. Right? So <laughs> it has nothing to do with the time on the clock. Right? So the, the chronos, the time on the clock, has changed over time, right? The initial chronos was when we got writing, we had the calendar. With the invention of the calendar, humans were taken out of that sort of purely organic natural time, and now they had a past and a future, right? Now we had history that we could write down, and we had a future in contracts that we could be accountable for. Religion changed from the sort of polytheism to, you know, a, a, a future based Moshiach oriented, back to Zionism, Moshiach oriented uh, uh, religion. Right, where now we, can, now we can have a monotheism, there's one God, and the world's not right yet because it's going to be right someday in the future. But that's, that, that's why we, we wrote a contract with God as Torah. It's a covenant. It's a contract. We do this now. You do that later. And we built a society around that right up until the invention of the clock. Then we got a new chronos. We got chronos of time, of mechanical chronos. And mechanical chronos led to great efficiencies and expansion and money and all that what we were talking about. Now we get digital chronos. Digital chronos is different from analog chronos. Right? You think about the, the analog clock I had next to my bed when I was a kid, the, the clock radio with a sweep second hand, they called it. And it went around, and each minute had a narrative, had a beginning, a middle, and an end. There's a fresh minute, and then it goes around the middle, and then it's coming up around the back. And then, oh, it's a new fresh 902, a new fresh minute. But it was, it was, I remember I watched it, and it had that circular feeling to it. When I got my first digital clock, it was the kind with the little flip cards, remember those? And it would be like 901, bop, 902, bop, 
903, right? So time now is no longer this thing that moves, right, over a circle. Now time is something that stands still. It's absolute. What is a minute in the analog universe? A minute is a 60th of an hour. What is a minute in the digital universe? It's an absolute. It's a duration. It's an eternity now. To it's load. an eternity. I mean, that's, you know, who would right. wait a minute to load something if it's loading up? It's that pinwheel of death you get if you're a Mac user, you know. Exactly. It just sits. Yeah. And you don't know if the pinwheel of it, it might just be sitting there. Right. Yeah, or it might be, yeah. you don't know if something's passing or not anymore. It's just there. Um, and that's, it's, it's a totally different, totally different society that you're going to live in. It's a presentist society. Which is why, and it doesn't mean we're not going to have any goals. We're not ever going to ever do anything on a campaign or an ends justify the means thing. But it means that the, the bias of a digital media landscape, as McLuhan might call what we're in now, that the bias of this media environment is going to be presentist rather than futurist. It's going to be in now-based things rather than in goal-based things. And it, it's good on a certain level because it can get us off the growth spiral and into some sort of sustainable things. How do we sustain? It's kind of like middle age where it's less about where am I going than all right, how am I going to just hang on to these teeth, you know, another few, <laughs> another few decades, you know. But it's, it's unbearable, right? It's unbearable to just be if we're not comfortable with ourselves as human beings. Uh, okay. So when you, when you talked about the difference between, you know, the first clock, and then we have a digital clock. You know, the, the transformation you were talking about when it comes to the first clock strikes me as you know, almost like a big disruption in how we see the world, how we see time. And in the examples that you use, in the book at least, uh, a lot of the examples regarding sort of the present shock are sort of things that like, are happening in our society that are just sort of optimized a little better with new technology. Like, so it doesn't feel so disruptive so much as we're just doing the same stuff a little faster. No, I mean, I'll just use a few examples I'd written down. Um, uh, one, you know, you talk about black box trading, sort of really fast algorithmic trading. You know, the entire sort of stock market infrastructure isn't all that different. It's just we do, we do everything faster. You talk about 30-year mortgages and how people have these 30-year mortgages they can't afford because they, they think about today and they don't think about the, the lifetime of the 30-year payment. You know, that's something we've had for decades, we can just sort of fool people better about them and package them and sell them on the, on the financial markets better. Um, you talk about you know, behavioral econ economics have been around a long time, burning crops that we don't need. This whole, so, uh, you know, uh, Black Friday consumerism, these are all things we've had for a long time. They're sort of part of our society. And now technology just, lets, just sort of makes us more, have, have less agency in the face of them. It doesn't feel yes disruptive no. so much as just. I mean, I would think. The, so doesn't the a emphasis, difference, I guess. The emphasis changes to the point where we flip into a different mode, right? We, futures were always around, stock futures. People used them, right? Now, we, though, we live in a world where I think most people, they're not buying stocks in order to hold them until they're valuable in some future. They're buying stocks to make money on the trade. Facebook had its catastrophic IPO because people bought that stock in the morning thinking they could sell it by noon and make money. And at noon, it hadn't made any money. And they go, oh my god, what's going on? And they sell it. Right? When people can't make money on a stock by buying it the normal way, they buy the stock 30 days in the future. Right? I'll buy the derivative of that stock. So I can buy it 30 days from now and compress that time into this moment. If I'm not happy with that, I can buy a derivative of the derivative. So I can buy the derivative 30 days in the future. Then derivatives trading, this is where it's different. Derivatives trading got so big that the derivatives market, three, four months ago now, bought the New York Stock Exchange. Right? So that's the flip. It's that not the derivatives didn't exist before, but the derivatives exchange, the abstraction, ate the stock market, which itself was an abstraction of the marketplace, which itself is an abstraction of human activity trading and sharing. Right, which we don't even really need money anyway if we all loved each other and all. But yeah, we don't. We're evil, and so we'll keep using money and keep track of everything. So that's where I would argue is the flip happened. There's a moment in somebody's life where, you d where email is no longer this thing that you're going to get to at the end of the day and answer. I mean, email used to be a place where I sounded smarter than I did in real life. Because I would have an email, and I would take an hour or two and think, how am I going to? What am I going to do? And I did it in my time. 
when email goes on your body and it's this thing, we all flip to that place where email is a place where you're dumber than you are in real life because you're no longer exploiting the atemporal bias of the technology. You're being, you're being uh, uh, disoriented um, by, by that. And, and th they're subtle, but I do think that it's a, it is a, a shift in, in character, in quality. The quality of the digital landscape is different, where, where one was time management and the other is being carried along by a program, where the program enacts and you you follow the timing of it. It's like the difference between going to a museum and they say you have an hour to look at this room and to look at the paintings. And you can go around and see the paintings, you've got an hour, then you're done, ding, and you leave. That's old time. New time is you get strapped into the cart at Disney World and you're conveyed through this thing for an hour the way it, it conveys you. It's the same hour, right? But there's a, a one of them is sort of programmed and the other one has at least some sense of, uh, of freedom within the, within, the, uh, within the unit of time. Okay, so I'm glad you brought up Disney World actually because this goes back to, I love that the technology we're talking about the most today is the clock. Yeah. But, it, but much of this book is actually about time and mm -hmm. I think there's a sub theme there which is about patience and our lack of it. So I was at Disney recently with my two young kids and you know, everyone knows about Fast Pass. You know, oh, it used to be, yeah. I grew up in Florida for my sins. And I used to go to Disney on the off season as Florida residents can do. And there was no such thing as fast pass. And you stood there broiling in the sun. Everyone was equal, unless you were in a wheelchair and then you went to the front of the line. That was it. And you don't um, really hire people to do that. No, now, now yeah, now <laughs> you can actually hire someone to drive you around in a scooter. It's terrible. But, but worse than that, and there was just a story in the New York Times business section the other day about this is going on at Universal Studios as well. It's now a VIP, you can get a VIP pass for 300 bucks. Um, you can get to the front of every line. You can get a special buffet breakfast. So there, I, but what I, I'm using all these examples yeah. not to say that anything's different. This is a deeply human impulse. I want to be at the front of the line. This is a human impulse, yeah. right? So when you see, uh, I think if you look at how people queue, even in different nations, people line up differently and there are all kinds yeah. of rules of social behavior. But I do think to, to Marvin's earlier point, the one big difference is the acceleration. That our tolerance for weight, for example, for anything, mm has dramatically shrunk in, in just a decade. Our tolerance for the sorts of things that we used to take for granted as just being part of the human experience has almost disappeared yeah. in some context. Um, and I think yeah. that that is something that technology has an active role to play. And it's not necessarily one that we can step back from any right. longer. It's tricky. And, and I would argue it's not that our hunger for the experience, for the future experience, has gotten stronger. I would argue it's that our intolerance for our present experience has grown bigger, right? It's it's not that that thing is so great. It's really not. I, I don't I don't think we're there. I think it's that we don't somehow everything between here and that doesn't seem to exist. It's some weird existential nothing. It's like uh, I used to describe it to to like Esselin type people. Is it's like. It's like, if the, it's like time only matters when you're in the tick of the clock. Tick, tock, tick, tock. And all that space in between each tick and that tock is just existential wasteland. Oh my god, there's nothing. Without that sense of, of traction, of friction, getting from thing to thing to thing. You know, and that's, to my, my mind, that's end state industrial age thinking when we were all about the metrics and all, you know, whatever metric we put on the wall, whether it was GNP or time or this over that, you know, the sort of hockey stick like way that we now interpret internet growth, that's the wrong way of thinking about a digital age because a digital age is going to be spent, the majority of our digital time is going to be in the, it is in that pulse, it's in that space between the things. So it's like, it's how we are online. You know, you are online, but that's where life is spent. Life is spent on the line, not on the ride, in a sense. So what have we done? And then you start looking around, well, where is the line? Line is my neighborhood. Line are the people who live next door to me who I don't know because I'm so busy driving to get to those people I really do want to see as opposed to these ones I happen to live with. You know, so it's sort of, it's sort of that. And it gets, I know, it sounds sort of homespun or, 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 you know, Lake Wobegon or something. But I, I do think it's a matter of people looking around. Who do I live with? Who, who's in my life? Who, 
who are the other humans? You know? Or even just, it's also an argument for something that used to be difficult to achieve, but that we actually now all have more of, which is leisure time and the ability to be idle. And that interstitial time, those little moments used to be when people did things like daydream, when people had creative discoveries. I mean, some famous scientists throughout history had their aha moments while sitting on the bus looking out the window or think, you know, we... Or in we, their fever. Or in their fever, or yeah. in the shower. I mean, literally in the shower. I mean, the, the, or in the bath. I mean, these are moments that we now can occupy constantly with other word. stimulation and the <laughs> not occupy. Um, but we, we can, and it's, it's actually, in fact, become a compulsion to do so. And so there is something lost that, again, you can't, you can't monetize what's lost, whereas you can monetize right. the time you spend on the phone sending an email to your boss. Right. And that's, again, it's, the, it's the, the improper amplification of the agenda of the industrial age, which is to monetize every possible moment and every possible thing, and somehow pulling back from that and saying, no, this time is valuable, even though it's not contributing to the GNP, right? now, even though I'm not producing or consuming. It's all that kind of Sabbath stuff. You know, it's when the, the first thing the Jews gave themselves when they learned how to write was one day off, you know, one day a week. You know, and what was that about? They kind of saw the writing on the wall, so, so to or speak. Or the line, it, it's a small world after all in the future, <laughs> which takes about half a day because it doesn't have fast pass. Sorry, I'm still traumatized. Small, day, <laughs> small, world was the small world was the shortest line. But you know what the interesting thing was? When I was online for um, goofy uh, runaway, runaway uh, was that Stormborn, Barnstormer? Yeah. It, it was a great, there's a great ride in the tune. It's a little roller because we we're online for that. And this girl, I heard her ask her father, um, we're looking at the sign, it said 90 minutes till, I mean, my God, to get on a 30 second roller coaster. 90 minutes, and she looks up and she goes, Dad, what's a minute? And I was wondering, how is he going to respond, right? In a digital age, a now minute? That's an existential question. What it does is. he say? What is a minute? And he goes, Oh, it's a, a minute is a, a, a 60th of an hour. It was nice. A 60th of an hour. Or, or 60 seconds, I think he said. 60 seconds, what's that? 60th of an hour. At least he didn't give her a smartphone and say, play Cut the Rope, then you'll know. <laughs> yeah, well, you see them, yeah. You see them on there. So, so yeah. I mean, to some extent, the things we're talking about feel like um, the things that are not good for us. For example, trying to, trying to buy Facebook in the morning and trying to sell it in the afternoon. Right? But that's certainly not how Warren Buffett trades. Right? What Warren Buffett does, the whatever, third wealthiest man. He's 90 years old. 90 years old. He buys, you know, he always bought and hold, held. Right. And then there's an entire school of thought around buying and holding, right? Uh, and, and then there's an entire school around just buy long-term index funds, and that'll work. Not sexy, very not sexy. Just, yeah. just do what they're doing, and they, and they succeed. Uh, and then there are all these people who take, you know, email holidays, or they turn off their phones, et cetera. I mean, to what extent is this sort of, you know, uh, the, uh, there's a sucker born every moment, and the suckers are the ones who are being caught up in the technology, but you can actually get off the train uh, if you know better. Yeah, except it's the suckers at this point are not just individuals, but are the institutions, governments, and companies that we work for and with. And when- Except for the New America Foundation. And of course not. <laughs> but when we're twice removed from the operating system, as we are in many cases, it becomes even that much less accessible to us. Right? So we're once removed in that we don't understand the technology, and then we're twice removed in that we think that the institutional bias can't be changed. So you know, the, the people I meet with now are CEOs who literally ask me questions like, how can I transform this company from a growth company into a sustainable company? How can I liberate it from the shareholders who need to see quarter over quarter. How can I convince my board that this is a company that needs to expand and contract over time, that we've reached a sustainable state? You know, those, are, those are the kinds of questions that they should be asking. And uh, those are big. And they're really hard. They're really hard to ask. How does a politician say, look, Frank, you know, Frank Luntz, you know, you're a good guy, but I don't want to know the second to second people meter response of the CNN audience of 12 to my speech as it's being said. I really don't care. I really, really don't care. And I don't want it broadcast to the public as if they should care about that. It ends up being this feedback loop. You know, say, oh, look, Obama failed the debate because I saw the little red line go down when he talked about that thing. You know, it's, 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 that, that's, that's the faux presentism that's, that's killing us. 
So in your book, you sort of set out five different principles for present shock. Yeah. And you give them great, some of them have like Greek names. They're, they're, they're like hard to pronounce even. I made them up. Uh, so, we got uh, them on Wikipedia. Uh, so there's <laughs> narrative collapse, digifrenia, uh, overwinding fractalia. Fractal noia. Fractal noia, fractal noia, missing an N. And then uh, apocalypto. Apocalypto. Tell us about apocalypto. That has the best name. It's like of the a world. superhero name, right? Yeah. <laughs> apocalypto is what happens when, when you're living in a presentist world, uh, it, it becomes kind of unbearable. Right? You don't want to just be in the now. So you imagine, you'd rather imagine a future apocalypse, a terrible thing coming, than nothing at all. Right? Which is why I think there's so much sort of zombie apocalypse lore right now. People would ra it's easier to imagine a zombie apocalypse than it is to imagine what's going to happen five years from now. I mean, it genuinely is. And there's almost a simplicity to the zombie apocalypse. People <laughs> long for that. You're just in a cabin with your family on the top of a hill with a shotgun taken down slow-moving zombies. I mean, there's no Twitter feed, there's no Facebook, there's no phone to answer. It's just, it's, it's this back-to-nature sort of Kaczynski, it's a sort of Unabomber fantasy of, of uh, ultra-simplicity. You know, but the, 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 the dark side of it is that it's human loathing, right? The, apocaly the, the apocalypto of zombie apocalypse, is the, the, the question of those movies is always, what's the difference between a human and a zombie? What, that, that you can't even tell, right? They're always staring off at zombies walking, going, what's the difference between that zombie and me? They want to eat, they want to survive, and so do we, and we kill things. What really is the difference, right? And that's a dangerous question for people to ask or not be able to answer. And that's where I feel like my peers are at, my sort of cyber pundit peers, you know, Ray Kurzweil and Richard Dawkins and, and uh, 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 Kevin Kelly and James Glick, that they, that they understand the digital age with... A, a, an industrial age Christian narrative overlay. That this isn't just the digital age moving into the sustainable presentism thing. We're moving towards the singularity. This is part of a journey. Information has been on an evolutionary journey from simplicity to complexity. And it's a very long journey. And human beings are only important insofar as we can contribute to information's journey. But once computers are better at it than we are, then humans can sort of fade into the background and computers can continue this journey for us. Right? And that moment is coming and it's the singularity. Now, that's also human loathing. That's right? a zombie apocalypse though, right? I it mean, Ray Kurzweil literally wants to upload your brain and he's like downing right. vitamins to stay alive so and that he can do that. Uploading your brain is easy as long as there's no such thing as a true human. As long as there's no human, as long as we are just information, then you may as well upload us. And, but I would argue that's got the medium and the message reversed, right? We are not the carriers of information. Information is the, is the representation of human consciousness. But Kurzweil is like, what, number three now? He's way, way high up at Google now creating yeah. artificial intelligence right. technology for them. I mean, he's, you know. Yeah, and it goes back to the early 1970s debates between like Timothy Leary and uh, uh, Marvin Minsky, where <laughs> Minsky was doing artificial intelligence. And Leary and his folks were into LSD. intelligence augmentation. Right? The idea was that you use technology to augment human intelligence rather than to recreate or simulate human intelligence. I don't, and, and, and I am on the Leary team, not just because I was psychedelic, but I'm on the Leary team because I'm on team human. Right? And, and, and Kurzweil and Dawkins call it hubris. Why do you think humans matter? Why should humans matter? Because I'm a human, you know, and I'm going to fight for team human as a human in the face of this, even being wrong because it's my team, right? This is the one I'm on. Um, and I genuinely do believe that there are aspects of the human experience that are not recreated in Second Life and that won't be. And that in some ways the beauty of all these digital simulations is they help reify what is different about humans than that, you know, which is again, how do we reify what's going on at the table with your horrible family? You know, I, yeah, I'm a terrible dad. Um, how is that better than what's going on on, you know, on, on the iPad right now? As a kid growing up, at every family meal, I would run off and read a book. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I'm sure it was looked at, you know, back when it's just as bad, right? My mom would always complain about my book. Ah. But she probably complained more about, about the iPhone. She would. <laughs> if I had one. Um, but yeah, when you're a kid, uh, 
you know, adults can be boring. So yeah. uh, we have about 20 minutes for questions. Uh, and we have a few questions. Uh, oh, wait, should you, he yeah, should wait for the microphone. microphone. And then say your name and, uh, and affiliation. Even though we know. We already yeah. know who you all we are. All, yeah. we've, done, we've done retinal scans <laughs> on everybody secretly. My name is Richard Miller, and I don't have any affiliation. I'm somewhat retired. Um, Doug, I think you get it. I think you understand it. I think you understand not just now, but where we got there and all the rest of it. I'm curious about what you've done with your life. The one part you do say in the book is when you were writing it, how you did certain weeks of certain things. But beyond that, what are you, if you were willing to share it, what have you done to cope with uh, present shock? Um, I mean, for each of us, th there's a different uh, kind of dominant uh, trouble spot, right? Um, so for me, it always has to do with uh, kind of personal achievement and making money versus spending time with my family and doing what my wife wants, right? And it's really just so... Just lean in. Oh, no, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard. So it's like, you know, the Snowden thing happens and I'm coming back home on the train from New York to Westchester, exhausted, and knowing I'm going to get up at 5 in the morning to come here for this. Um, and they're pinging all, pinging my phone. I'm not going to look. I'm not going to look. They're pinging my phone, pinging, all right, who, what? And it's um, uh, Wolf Blitzer, the Situation Room. Will you come on and talk about, you know, present shock and Snowden and all that? Uh, and I'm like, you know, no. And it was hard. And I still was tossing and turning at night. Am I sacrificing book sales and aspects of my career? Could I have gotten to the next level or done the thing? But it was like enough already. So for, in one sense, it's sort of the work-home balance. It's learning how to make that choice and, and really leave it, leave it go. It, it, that's sort of the big area for me. I mean, in little things, it was just like leaving Facebook Right, seeing that no Facebook does not offer as much value as it extracts from me in all these ways. I don't like being pinged by people I knew way back when. I spent 20, 30, 40 years getting away from them. I don't, <laughs> I don't want them coming back. I don't trust Zuckerberg. I don't want to be there asking for likes from people when I don't know how those likes are going to be used against them. Um, I use the VIP features on my phone. Now, so that my wife can vibrate my phone, but no one else can, you know, because you can have it, you can you can sort of select things. Um, I learned how to code not well, but well enough to feel like I understand algorithmic thinking and sort of uh, I can think critically about these um, these things. I've learned to value my local reality more than the kind of long distance. Reality, I see the net as a great thing. I love the net, I'm all for it, but I, I'm, I'm, I look at the net less as the way to develop these uh, giant scaled models for things and instead to model local, uh, local uh, solutions to things. Uh, so a lot of it has to do with, for me, just learning to say, um, learning to say no, learning what's enough, trying to trust my human connections with other people more than the long-term value of my portfolio. Uh, you know, it's things like that. It's, it's a lot of it has to do with, with abandoning certain amount of abstraction whenever possible and, and, and doing, uh, going into real, real world. I mean, that's a few. Hi, uh, my name is Dave Price. I'm a retired journalist. And interesting about time, because when you retire, time has a whole different meaning, too, right. obviously, of control. But what I, I would be interested in any of the three of you, but especially you, Doug, talking about this. A group of us are going to put together a small easing, okay, all retired people, which you can do. And I think back when I started in newspapers, uh, President Nixon was president then. And it took, in the small paper that I started with, give or take 90 people to do what one of us can do now. So my question is, it's not like we're talking about a future, we're here now. What about those other 89 people that once had a job, okay, 
same product, better, different. You know, you could argue all that. But what, what happens to them? I mean, you started to touch on it, you know, whether it's Etsy or whatever. But what happens to those people in this time as we move toward, you know, toward the direction we're moving? We haven't replaced the industrial jobs. We can talk about it all day. They're not coming back. It's meaningless. So what about those people? How do they survive? You know, what do they do in the interim while they're creating this poetry, which would be great, but what happens? Well, we don't really want to pay journalists now, is the thing. There's not enough employed to do the job that we need done. You know, it's like Britney Spears pops a zit and there's 40 news vans outside her house when I bet two's news vans could actually cover it sufficiently. <laughs> and meanwhile, there's like some, you know, zillion people getting killed in, in Burma or something, or whatever we're supposed to call it, and, uh, and, and there's nobody there. It's like the closest guys in, in New Guinea. You know, going on a cell phone, trying to talk to CNN, can't even speak English or something. It's like, what the heck is going on? And it's because whenever I go to colleges and talk, they'll say, well, why should you be paid to do journalism when I have a blog and nobody's paying me? You know, it's like, why should there be a White House press corps? Why should there be anybody? It's like, why should we pay anybody? Because corporations and governments are spending hundreds of millions of dollars to create fake stories, and we need to pay somebody a couple hundred bucks to spend a week to figure out What's actually going on? You know, and that, that argument needs to be made to the public. And then um, I think they will, they will value it. I mean, I think, uh, oddly enough, I think of, so does Warren Buffett, by the way. I think newspapers are a growth industry. I think that they've, uh, they've diminished because people have lost sight of what the, what the point and value of professional journalism is. But it, Warren, Warren Buffett invests in newspapers because they're a monopoly and he likes monopolies. They used to be local monopolies and they're very profitable and secure. Mm. But um, I, mean, I think you know, the challenge of what do we do with both the future of media and the future of jobs I think is, is hugely important and hard to answer. So when it comes to the future of journalism, it's not just that there are bloggers, it's that there was an era when there were three TV shows, three TV channels, and you could essentially subsidize the news through the other, through the other uh, profit-making uh, enterprises of the of the business, and now you get to a point where you know news is supposed to sort of sit on its own uh, bottom, I guess. And you know news doesn't have some of the benefits that entertainment has in terms of profitability. You can't syndicate it and show you can you can show Seinfeld over and over t ten years later. You can't show news ten years later. It's expensive to gather, uh, unlike a reality show where people will do it for free. So it's sort of more expensive and on, on the one end, and then harder to. to make enough money from on the other end. And then we've had all this massive consolidation. Just a few companies own the media, uh, a lot of the media companies, and so they don't have to compete as aggressively. Uh, and so we have this entire you know, sort of economic story as to what do we do about the future of news. And there's been, and I go to panels all the time and conferences, how do we, you know, what happens with the future of news? Do we get you know, government funding? Then that has issues. Do we get um, uh, some sort of uh, nonprofit, for-profit, combination. Uh, there's something called the B Corp, which is like a corporation that also has a, um, a social good uh, component to it. And Etsy actually is one of those. And so people have been trying to figure out, just, you know, how do we solve the problem of the future of journalism? And I don't think I've really seen a great answer, but there are lots of different experiments. Um, on the question of what do we do about the jobs, we could go to a, to a world where all of us get food and shelter and then uh, play video games. I would love that. Uh, it would be, be a great world. Well, we get food and shelter, but then if you want above basic is when you figure out how to innovate and sell things and actually do things of greater value to people. Okay, but, this, but, so the, but there's another underlying question here about which the media conundrum, I think, throws into high relief, which is there is such a thing as expertise. And this goes to the presentism. Expertise takes time mm -hmm. to cultivate. It takes experience to learn. It requires often other experts to train you and then to review your work. And that sort of expertise, I think there is a, an idea that any kid who you talk to on a college campus who has a blog is doing the same thing that uh, you know, a BBC News reporter is doing. And they are not. And no. they don't have the same sources. They don't have the same access to sources for a reason. Yep. You know, they're 21-year-old you know, bloggers. Yep. They, uh, now, some bloggers break news. We've seen this this yep. week with, with basically Glenn Greenwald, a blogger, broke this big story. So it's not that that can't happen, but that I think there's a huge denigration of the even idea yep. of expertise and professionalism yep. that this technology has and fueled. as the culture of expertise dies, as that ecosystem goes away, so does its, your connection as a journalist to the 2,000 years of journalism that's happened before. You know, like an easy example is when, when Clear Channel came and kind of destroyed the FM. Yeah. Yeah. Ecology, FM radio ecology, 
you know, and they, you know what, what they did, and they had long distance, basically, they had, you know, have a guy sitting in, a, a computer sitting in Los Angeles broadcasting out all the local radio to everybody else. They stopped making money with it, so they sell back all the stations, but now the people are gone. The culture was stopped, so you can't just grow back, you know, 50 years of a developing FM radio uh, expertise. And same thing with journalism. If we, if we really scorch earth the whole thing, then we don't have that connection to, um, to the past. So I, I disagree with everything you just said, uh, other than that we shouldn't square truth the past. There hasn't been 2,000 years of journalism. Journalism well. has changed repeatedly. And the ethics of journalism come partly from economics, come from the 1800s when you had the telegraph and the news wires, which needed to have objective sounding news. And that displaced the old party politics and very non-objective news before, because it was too expensive to have a whole bunch of different news wires sending lefty news and righty news. There became this idea that objectivism was what journalists should do, but it was an economic imperative. It's advertising, and, yeah. And, and they also do with advertising. So a lot of the, you know, journalism has always been sort of subject to economics, and the things that we valorize around expertise of journalists often, and Glenn Greenwald's a great example, often there are bloggers who have more expertise than any journalist in that area. Uh, because I often, wouldn't say he has more expertise in the area he's now covering. I think he lucked out with a source who decided to leak something to him, which is a very he's, different he's thing than three expertise. Books on the, he's written three books on the subject. He is a constitutional lawyer. I mean, he knows, he knows what he's talking about. He's not objective, though. No, he's, not, he's not objective, but I never but none said of he them was. Are. I said right. he was an expert. No, 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 no. I said he has expertise. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's, OK, go ahead. Hey, uh, my name's Park McDougald. I'm a 21-year-old blogger. Um, <laughs> but, Welcome. Um, did you graduate junior high school? <laughs> yes, I did. I did. Oh, you're, um, you're in. Well, what, this well, question will just show off his expertise. He doesn't need any credentials. Oh, don't set him up. Let him ask his own well, question. <laughs> so it sounded to me like a lot of the problems you were describing were structural rather than individual in nature. Um, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with Slavoj Žižek, but he gave a talk at the Subversive Festival a week or two ago. Um, and he was sort of talking about the participatory democracy as this orgasmic type moment where everyone comes together and there's a commune and for two months and no one has to work and they hang out in the park or whatever, but it doesn't really do anything. And then 20 years down the line, they're, sorry, they're meeting in a coffee shop or a bar and talking and about the good old days when they got together and protested. And then one guy says, oh, my boss is calling me. I got to go back to my job at the bank or driving a truck or doing whatever. And it's this pressure valve for people to get out their frustration against the system or whatever. But nothing is really accomplished that might change people's situation. And you guys kind of talked about people opting out, you know, saying, I'm just going to put away my cell phone. But if you're someone on the bottom end of the economic ladder, maybe you don't have that option. You know, maybe your boss is going to fire you if you're not on call or whatever. So I guess just maybe talk about the, I'm interested in the politics of this and how you see, I guess, the, you know, changing individual attitudes as something that's going to make what you're talking about a possibility or reality for most people right. or most Americans. I mean, I'm working it on three, uh, on three access points. Most simply, I'm trying to tell bosses that they're going to make less money if they treat their workers like that. That their workers are going to have worse health, they're going to get cancer, they're going to lose their efficiency, that there's a better way. That sort of appeal to, their, appeal to their pocketbook. Second, I'm trying to tell them they're going to have more fun if they can liberate their company from the requirement to make their workers be that way. In other words, do you want to buy back your company from your shareholders, like Michael Dell, although he didn't do it really to, for the real reasons. He's going to resell it to the IPO later. Um, do you want to, to buy back your company? Do you want to do something and make that? And then I'm looking at it from a structural level. How do we help communities develop their own economies? If you've got people with skills and you've got people with needs, then you don't necessarily need a bank to lend money to a factory to put a plant in a town to give people jobs so they have money to buy stuff from each other. You can actually have local currencies and local favor banks and all sorts of things that you can start to develop now. In a digital age, we've got cell phones with authentication. It's not, I mean, maybe a decade, two, four, eight decades away, but peer-to-peer -peer transaction and local currencies and alternative currencies are, are actually going to happen and free people up uh, in, in a different way. You know, so there will be options for people other than jobs in order to create exchange value. 
So this reminds me that we had um, the CEO of Etsy. Actually, Etsy's come up several times. He spoke here about a year ago, and I remember him saying, we might be moving into an era where people don't have jobs and careers, but do stuff to get by and then you know, play video games. Right? And so you have people who make things on Etsy and sell them, who um, rent out their second bedroom on Airbnb, get some cash, who, I don't know, do task grab it, do some tasks for people and make a little bit of cash. It doesn't really sound like a glamorous lifestyle, but sort of we're moving towards a moment where people might create their own little personal brand slash job on Etsy and Airbnb and not, not aspire to create jobs for others or build a business, just be sort of micro entrepreneurs, you know, sort of being self-sustaining. I don't know how... And eat good food, have eat good, good food, sex, enjoy the pay sun. Pay each other I mean, with Bitcoin. It turns out there's all this stuff that might actually be more fun than getting to be rich and famous and important. I, would, I wouldn't know the experience, Doug, but I think, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll well, ask We have to call Wolf Blitzer. Because they call Wolf Blitzer, yeah. Like, all right. Let's um, get back on that track. You know, maybe we'll take a few. We've got like four or five minutes. So maybe, you know, back there, there's a woman who had her hand up for a while. Um, Hi, I'm Jenny Holm with Internews. Uh, Jonathan Safran Foyer had an op-ed in the New York Times a couple of days ago about how our technology has allowed us to retreat from our obligations for caring for others um, that I think resonates a lot with this talk. But, and I liked it very much and I agree with it on most points, but I'm also thinking that now the way that the world is, we have ethical obligations to care for one another online as well. A lot of you know close relationships because of the way our society is are mediated online. So to, to decide to say leave Facebook or you know do whatever it is on an individual level without a collective agreement that this is what we're going to do is may also be kind of a um, you're, you're retreating from your ethical responsibilities and your moral responsibilities to one another there. So how do we mediate that and what what do we do I guess given the situation. One, let's grab one more question and then we'll uh, you, go ahead. Hi, uh, Ari Schulman with The New Atlantis. Um, hey. I'm just wondering, uh, I'm, this is sort of popping into my head just now, so it's not fully formulated, but y the, y what you're talking about a lot, you seem to be coming back to, uh, you know, eating food and having sex and basically all of these, uh, basically having all of our, of our lower level Maslowian needs supplied for us so that we can do the things that are at the top of the pyramid, that seems to, that echoes to me a sort of utopianism that's been around since the industrial era uh, of, of having all of those basic needs supplied. And to me, that sounds like a, a utopianism that is uh, of a same kind with the kind of digital presentism that doesn't have any sort of sense of purpose or meaning or pushing towards the future. Uh, I can see ways in which those could be opposed, but they seem more similar. I'm, I'm wondering, what, what is your vision of a sort of uh, alternative uh, social and economic structure? Uh, what is the, the meaning of, of personal striving in that, in that alternative that you're trying to articulate? All right, so two questions. Let me work backwards. Um, what, I can, what I can state as true is that the bias of a digital media environment will be less towards future goals, where are we going as a people, what is our direction, than it is presentist, right? That, that the, the bias of an industrial age is towards the future, and usually towards branding a future, right? The branding, oh, the French deserve the South of America, or you know, you brand it as something else, as some uh, uh, triumphalism, or you, you're rebranding co colonialization by another name. And yeah, we've had some good goals too, like, oh, we're going to save people, we're going to do this. Um, but in a, in a presentist environment, what we need to do right, is figure out how do we create ethical containers? How do we uh, uh, evolve? Uh, Human, human behavior without the emphasis and without the bearings that eyes on the prize, long-term targeted goals used to give us. Is there another place from which we can derive an ethos? You know, the, the, the 
Some people would say, oh, that's, you know, I, I can feel it in my gut. You know, but usually the gut people are doing sort of impulsive panic fear stuff too, not true sort of long-term sustainable something. So we end up, rather than being governed by our gut, we're governed by the community, which is sort of what Occupy was going for. Saying, OK, rather than having goals, let's see sort of what emerges in some sort of rave-like, uh, uh, you know, connective, uh, collaborative fashion. As far as Maslow, I think Maslow was wrong. And Maslow, at the end of his career, kind of poo-pooed on his own hierarchy of needs. The problem with the hierarchy of needs, it's a consumer's fantasy. What's at the very top? Self-actualization. There is no self, right? The self is a construction of the Renaissance. The self was invented around Dr. Faustus' time. The self. There is no self, right? There's only the others. There's only people. There's only hu humanity is a, is a collective. It's not, uh, you're not, an individual will, will die pretty fast if he's disconnected from, from the group or he'll go crazy. So I think, I'm not into to Maslavian utopianism, but I am into helping describe visions that allow people to embrace the reality they're in rather than panic and run. Most people are in a state of panic now, and they're using their devices to try to orient to this presentist world. And the devices are throwing them even further away from whatever compass they might have. So I'm trying to tell people, and if it sounds utopian, I apologize. I'm just trying to tell people, it's OK. It's OK where people, there's other people, look into their eyes, and you're going to feel connected to them. Learn, re-establish re, re rapport, which used to be when you'd sort of breathe in rhythm with another person, take a look at the other 94% of human communication that happens non-verbally, and experience yourself in a room. It's OK. It's all right. No, you're not making money right now. I know, I know, I know. You're in no, 10 minutes. You're not going to make money. It's OK. <laughs> oh. You know, so I'm doing that. And that sounds utopian, but I don't mean it to be. I mean it to just be, God. As far as Facebook, I mean, I've never, I've been, I, I've, got horrified responses when I wrote this piece saying I'm leaving Facebook, but none of them said it was unethical to leave Facebook. Um, and I think, and it's, it's odd, I'm not, I'm not yeah, um, I mean, the, the thing is, I think, I think being on Facebook is actually unethical, right, for a whole bunch of reasons. And as a public figure, as a public figure you know, on the internet, who many people sort of are modeling I would think modeling my internet behaviors as appropriate or not, my presence on Facebook, particularly as a self-promotional author, is inexcusable. It just can't, it cannot, it can't be justified because Facebook is going to use other people's pictures to advertise not just me, but things I might have liked. I mean, the, the flow through sponsored story, false representation of others is something I can't condone or invite from people. But the, the, the beauty of leaving, the net, of, not le of leaving Facebook is that so many emails I got were from people saying, you're really going to leave the internet? You're really going offline? And I was like, oh, no. It turns out Facebook is just one website. There's this other internet out there. And for people to just even learn that was really instructive for them. <laughs> because it is, it is true. I, and I do think, and everyone always says, oh, if you don't like the TV, then turn it off. Right? Well, if you don't like Facebook, then I'm turning that off. And it, it, yes, you know, there could be an old lady who is dying, but she should reach to her neighbors, not to me. You know, and my old ladies in my world know how to get me without Facebook. You know, so um, I don't feel like I've, I've shut someone out. I'm available. I'm more available than anyone should be. Um, it's just I, I feel that the, the, res the restrictions on my availability and the, the price people have to pay for my availability on Facebook isn't, um, isn't worth it. So I think we're, we're out of time. All that talk about um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs reminds me that I thought there'd be lunch. Yeah, we're so sorry. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the basic I, needs were not met. <laughs> uh, and uh, but Look at that. <laughs> we've, we've transcended them. And so that was probably a long hour and a half for you in terms of time. But we... Um, we hope that you go and uh, buy the book. eat food, buy the book. buy the book, have lots of sex, oh, and remember, <laughs> an expert told you to but do not it. not here. Yeah. Take, take so. it somewhere else. <laughs> Thank you.